I know they took it as their own thing when they discovered it in 1965, but it does not match the model. The amount we get is this amount if all the radiation is converted to three, the regular radiation is converted to 3K, that's the amount that we would get, and the Big Bang predicts about 100 times too much. The other interesting consequence is that out there at the border, if the mass of the particles approaches zero, so does their momentum. Is that part clear? Mm -hmm. The momentum is the mass times the velocity, and the velocity does not approach infinity. It approaches a constant. So if the mass approaches zero, the momentum approaches zero. If the momentum approaches zero, so does our uncertainty in the momentum approach zero. You can't have a big mistake over nothing. <laughs> if the momentum approaches zero, our uncertainty in the momentum also approaches zero. And then by Heisenberg's uncertainty principle, our uncertainty in where the particles are approaches infinity. The particles are required to recycle from that border. They can't just go bebopping across it. They have to bebop back in. But they don't come in on the train. <laughs> they tunnel back in. When an electron goes from one energy level in an atom to another energy level in an atom, it does not slide down the wall. <laughs> it disappears in this energy level and reappears in this energy level. Electrons and protons are not things, and they do what things cannot do. They disappear in one energy level and reappear in another energy level, and it's called tunneling. And the particles at the border can recycle back in just by tunneling. These things are like dollars in the bank. If you write a check on a bank in Santa Barbara for a da bank in Portland, nobody goes down and gets the stuff. It disappears in Santa Barbara and reappears in Portland. You must have noticed. So that's, you see, in my, in my model, that's the way it goes. We see a finite universe with a finite boundary, but the material from the boundary has to recycle back in. It gives the right amount of stuff recycling back in. It gives the, the, the right amount of background radiation. And it can go on indefinitely. Yes? How do black holes fit into your model? I don't think they do anything special, but I, uh, before uh, Hawking thought they leaked, I also suggested that they leaked. It seems to me that if something falls very, very low in the gravitational field, deep into a gravitational well, so that the rest mass has to get very small, I have to clean some of this up for you, so the rest mass gets very small, then the, mass, the momentum gets very small and they can leak out through the uncertainty principle, the same as they get back in from the border. That's how I see it. I don't think that black holes can stay permanently as black holes. I think they have to leak, just the same as the border has to leak. Now let me tell you all something. The, if we drop something, let's say we have an old-fashioned marshmallow an old-fashioned 10-gram marshmallow. If we drop it to a neutron star, we get one atom bomb's worth of energy in the splash. One gram comes out in the splash. Is that part clear to you? It's probably not, is it? All right, let's go back a little ways. Let's talk about watches. Let's say we have two identical spring-wound watches. One is wound up tight, one is unwound. They're both broken in exactly the same way, so they won't run. <coughs> Which one is heavier? <laughs> the wound up one is heavier because we put some extra energy in it, and energy is the only thing that's heavy. Now we're going to dissolve them in equal beakers of acid. What's the difference in the final solutions? One of them is warmer. Warmer means that the particles are moving faster. This time the extra weight is the weight of the kinetic energy. 
Energy is what's heavy, not something else. All right. Now, if we... All right, how do you wind up a cuckoo clock? Do you pull things down or pull them up? No, not both. You pull the weights up. You raise the center of gravity in the gravitational field to wind up a cuckoo clock. If you put it on a higher shelf, you've wound it up even more. Is that clear? All right. There's a reason why it's hard to walk uphill. You have to get heavier. <laughs> anyway, if we drop something to a neutron star, we get a tenth of its rest energy out in this flash. If we drop it to a small black hole, the event horizon of a small black hole, we get a third of its rest energy out in this flash. If you could put all the matter in the universe back together in a single black hole and drop your marshmallow in, you can get all of it out. The energy of an old-fashioned marshmallow is the energy of ten atomic bombs. I know they'll sell you a big bag of them at the grocery store for $1.69. They don't know what the hell they're doing. <laughs> Now, the work you have to do to space the universe out the way it is, is 500 atom bombs per pound. One pound of anything, whether it's cow dung or whipped cream, is the energy of the St. Helens explosion. One pound of anything. We don't take it as seriously as it really is. Now, it's also wound up by, being, by having the electrical particles so dinky. I learned that from Professor Lawrence at the University of California when I was a freshman in 1934. The work you have to do to push two electrons together makes them heavier together than they are apart. And if you had a great big electron and you made it smaller and smaller and smaller and smaller down to the size of an electron, that's how much it would weigh. There's nobody else in there. That was the most shocking piece of information that hit me at the University of California. I always thought that matter consisted of these dirty little particles with electrical charge. No. There is just the electrical charge, and the smallest of the electrical charge, and there's nobody else at home. The universe is massive because it's spaced out against gravity and because it's spaced in against electricity. And it's the same 500 bo atom bombs per pound. You see things small by seeing them spaced out. You see them spaced out by seeing them small. You cannot break a cookie into bigger and bigger pieces. Now what else do I have to say? <laughs> yes. Somebody translate that. I can't hear it. Oh, antimatter happens all the time, and it's no big deal. Uh, because of co cosmic ray bombardment, you're, you have an uh, electron and an anti-electron made in your body about once in two seconds, I think. Yes. That's not a big thing. But you cannot make matter out of radiation. That's one of the troubles the old Big Bang people had. If the fireball is radiation, you cannot get matter out of it. You can get 50-50 matter and antimatter. And when they find each other, they go back to radiation. Out of radiation, you can get radiation. You cannot get matter. So, but there's still another difficulty, and that is that radiation doesn't exist. No response. <laughs> you see, when, when, I was, when, we, when I was at the university, we used to make fun of the professors that on Monday, Wednesday, and Friday, they believe in the wave theory of light. And on Tuesdays, Thursdays, and Saturdays, they believe in the corpuscular theory of light. And on Sundays, they contemplate the problem in church. <laughs> But you see, Einstein's 19-5 equations put space and time in as a pair of opposites in just such a way that the separation between the emission event and the absorption event of a single photon always goes to zero. We see the bright star Sirius eight and a half light years away by seeing it eight and a half years ago. And in Einstein's equations, the space separation comes in squared with a plus sign and the time separation comes in squared with a minus sign. And if it's eight and a half squared, minus eight and a half squared, you're left without change.